Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the webinar this evening, which has been hosted by AHDP. And tonight we'll be discussing new approaches to parasite control to improve livestock and soil health. My name's Chloe, and I'm a Knowledge Transfer Manager for Beef and Lamb. And our presenters this evening are Rob Howe, Farm Animal Vet. Rob previously worked in the Southwest before opening the Lancashire-based vet practice in 2008. And as part of his Nuffield Scholarship, Rob will be exploring and defining the role of farm vets vets within regenerative agriculture. We'll then hear from Bruce Thompson, who farms 250 dairy cows on a conventional grass-based system with an emphasis on grazing grass to produce milk solids. And parasite control is one of the key components to the farm, and Bruce has adopted a more sustainable approach to anthelmintic usage by developing novel grazing practices. Bruce was also awarded an Oldfield Scholarship to investigate mitigating actions for anthelmintic resistance. And finally, we'll hear from Rich Thomas, and Rich, hopefully, will be um, you'll hopefully be able to see Rich soon. Just sorting the camera out. Rich found 300 acres in Hereford with 350 Romney Cross Aberfield ewes and 50 Pedigree Hereford cattle, 30 acres of arable and 30 acres of orchards. All stock are finished, with lambs finished solely off grass. So the plan of action this evening is that we'll hear short presentations from our presenters, and then there'll be plenty of time for Q and A and discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. This is a little orange arrow. If you click that arrow and to open up the questions box, click the drop down and you'll see where you can type your question in. And please also use this if you're having any technical problems and uh, we'll do our best to help. The usual advice is to log out and come back in. And if you're watching us through a mobile or tablet this evening, your questions box will be at the bottom of the screen with a question mark icon. And uh, this evening, we, you can get Dairy Pro points, so do let us know and, and pop your details into the chat if you'd like to receive those. So, Rob, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself and begin your presentation. Brilliant. Thank you, Chloe. Evening, everyone. Hope you're, um, oh, yeah, sure. Hope you're all uh, enjoying the football and not too worried that you're missing the game tonight. And thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, kindly sponsored my Nuffield, so I'm very happy to be talking this evening. Um, so I'll go straight into it. Um, I mean, parasitic disease of ruminants is of huge importance, um, and it's estimated to cost between fluke, lungworm and gutworm, EU countries, something like £1.8 billion pounds every year um, across the EU. 80% of that is production loss, and around 20% of that is um, uh, treatment costs. So I guess today is about whether we can do things differently and try and save on both of those areas of cost. Um, so that might mean using or trying to use fewer uh, wormers, but it's really important to, oh uh, yeah, so that we need to make sure that we keep um, animal health and productivity as our number one concern. But the new sort of consideration is the fact that there's beneficials out there that we're often missing if we're using um, uh, wormers indiscriminately. Slideshow, resume slideshow. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Right. So um, we did a, a bit of a um, pilot last year um, in the practice, and one of the most common um, factors we found was farming farmers and uh, were using uh, wormers throughout the season, either season long. Um, applications or repeated use of persistent wormers like ivermectins and for good reason it covered the risk um, simple easy and it was perceived to be low cost and low risk um, but actually some of the costs were quite staggeringly high um, and not always needed so we wanted to get involved with integrated parasite control planning so we started just by finding out what was going on um, and then trying to sort of demonstrate and expose some of the potential problems. So the first of those is if we use season long control um, or repeated porons, we will not allow our young stock to develop immunity. And that can lead to problems when our young stock become adults. That could be gutworm, abomasitis, or it could be lungworm. And there's also the fact that we could be accidentally killing off a bunch of other organisms that would do us good so, for example, the dung beetle alone every year is, is calculated to be a value something like 367 million a year just to the cattle industry in the UK. There's obviously resistance costs as well. The more we use wormers, the more likely that is to develop. 
and there's the actual financial cost of the worm app and the application. So I think we all know what resistance is. We're talking about the worms being resistant to the products we use. And refugia is a concept that's really important as our, our biggest way of, of tackling that resistance, preventing it coming. And all it means is we need to keep some of those worms uh, refuged, in refuge, away from the products we use. So leaving them unexposed to product. And there's two key ways of doing that. The first is we can continue to dose and move, but make sure that we don't treat all of the animals. And then those ones we don't treat harbor the un, um, unresistant worms to repopulate our pastures, or we can potentially delay the move and allow reinfection on the pasture that they're already on. So a little bit about resistance in the UK at the minute. Um, more done research, recent, relatively recent research shows that there's resistance to all of the main groups, the white, yellow, and clear drenches to slightly different levels and the, the white drenches being most affected. But uh, more recent research and cattle is thought to be less of a problem, but more, more recent research shows that um, it's certainly in Wales last year, this is research um, conducted by Urien Thomas, uh, it might be that the clear wormers are more of a problem for our, for our cattle. Um, so we need to bear that in mind. And I think the main message is here is that there's very simple tests you can perform to work that out. Okay, so let's move on to dung beetles and biodiversity and why, why we should be interested in this. And um, these are some pictures of different dung beetles, all from the UK. And they're quite beautiful little critters. And Bruce Thompson has done a whole Nuffield on this and absolutely full of knowledge and expertise. So I'm sure he's going to tell us a bit more about what he's doing at his place shortly. Um, but, they're, you know, they're beautiful. They're, they do great work for us. And they're a keystone species in biodiversity as well. Um, so firstly, for soil health, um, if we use wormers, especially ivermectins and SPs, synthetic pyrethroids, they knock out huge swathes of, of um, certainly dung beetles, but also a whole load of other organisms that are critical to soil health. Um, and soil health is gonna become a, a more and more important thing for us to be concerned about. Um, and this video won't work, but on the right, here's a, a cow pat from an animal that's been treated with ivermectin. And you'll notice this on your pastures, that it, it will not degrade very quickly. Uh, and the video on the left would have shown us a pat that's being absolutely devoured by swarms of, of dung beetles. And I'll, and I'll skip through some of this as we lost, lost a bit of time. But if you read some of the, um, yeah, in terms of uh, invertebrates, we know we're losing 2% of insects every year across the globe. And anything that we can do to, to mitigate that or prevent that is important. A lot of other animals higher up the food chain rely on them. Um, and we know that farm bird species compared to other bird species are declining in greater ways. And this is this is just one way. The anthelmintics we use is only one part of that, but it is a part that we need to, to consider. But there's also other mammals like bats, bat species. Um, certainly the great horseshoe relies on dung beetles that fly at night. Um, and there's so many different ways that the dung beetles provide value to, to us in the farming community. So they reduce nematode burdens, they increase dung removal, they uh, bury the organic matter into the soil, which helps with aeration and drainage, but also getting fertility back into that soil, um, and preventing soil um, erosion and, and allowing rainwater to infiltrate the ground. So I've mentioned that already, the, the value that they bring to us. Um, and this little diagram just shows that they how nicely how they bury down and every different species about maybe 40 to 60 species in the UK that do different things and it's important to have different types of them and they bury bury the dung down and, and or eat it in the pat itself um, and this is just uh, what what are some of the environmental concerns of these different products and if you look at some of the data sheets um, there's some pretty scary stuff in there and we just need to be mindful of how we use them we want to we want to continue to be able to use them. They're essential for our for farming, but you know, just trying to use them in a sustainable fashion is, I think, the key message. Um, so one of the things I just mentioned was that um, they reduce parasitic worm burdens. So this was a study conducted by Bryony Sands, and um, it contained three different dung pats. Some weren't, no dung beetles were allowed to get to them. That's the white box. Uh, 
the, the, the gray box was whatever dung beetles were around and the darkest box was where more dung beetles were added. And you can see that after eight weeks, um, the numbers of infective larvae of, of our nematode, our parasitic worms, was reduced by 30%. So in other words, the dung beetles were getting rid of the muck and preventing um, infective pastures, basically helping us considerably. The next, this, this next slide just shows that um, depending on which um, type of product we use for our wormer can knock out different types of, of dung beetles. So you've got two types in the UK, ones that just live in the pats and eat the dung and others that bury it. But normally you get a, uh, a ratio of about 60 to 40. If we use SPs, that reduces to 80, 20. And if we use ivermectin, we almost completely obliterate the really important ones that tunnel down into the ground. And the other really lovely story about dung beetles is they fly between their pats. If you look at that little guy hanging onto the back leg of this dung beetle on my finger, it's a predatory mite. And these mites um, use the dung beetles, don't do any harm, but they, they use them to travel between pats where they'll then devour the fly eggs and larvae of, of our nuisance flies. So they also provide us really nice help with control of, of flies. And the last piece of research from Bryony I wanted to mention was yet to be fully published, but a significant finding that it, ivermectin seemed to decrease grass growth by about 18%, which warrants further investigation. It's a bit of a shock to me and news to people that I've, um, clients I work with. So I'll move on to some of our um, control solutions for cattle, more integrate, um, integrated ones. So the first step, make use of vaccination. And for lungworm, we have a good one. Um, that's a really good insurance policy. And then secondly, rather than using uh, routine treatments, we can instead monitor the worm egg counts as well as looking at body condition score, growth rate, and other signs to know when we need to worm. And Bruce does this all the time. Um, you can do that by sending samples away through your vet or your trade, or, or like Bruce will do that at home himself, I think. Um, and then we can treat only when required and rotate products, and try and avoid some of the more harmful ones if we can. Um, and then lastly, at housing, a really important time for fluke. And there's different tests we can do to assess the need for fluke treatment. And last year, quite a lot of our clients didn't need to use any at all. Not necessarily going to be the case this year and also watch out for type two osteogeiasis. Two key points from the around 20 dairy farms were involved last year. We've got half of them stop, stopping using the MLs and the other half that still used MLs reduced their usage. And about 40% of the farms managed to go through the whole grazing season just by doing the things I mentioned in that previous slide um, without using a single wormer, which saved a lot of effort and money. Great, I'm going to whip through a few management solutions. So we've, I've kind of just gone through the very vetty, if you like, um, treatments and, and tests and, and vaccines. But these, this is the sort of stuff that Richard and, and Bruce are doing and you guys can do uh, on, on farms that don't even require that. Um, so some of the tactics we can make use of is using uh, other animals, whether that's different species um, or adults, to hoover up parasites. Um, so the cows will basically be immune and destroy the parasites that they ingest, which reduces the risk to the calves. Um, and just be careful of fluke and uh, hemonchus because actually that can infect both sheep and cattle. And then there's um, mob grazing or amp grazing, uh, which isn't one thing, but basically um, allows, you have very long rest periods, which breaks the life cycle of, of the parasites. The long grasses mean that um, a fewer of the worms will actually be ingested and all and a sort of variety of different species containing condensed tannins will um, are proven to reduce parasite burdens as well. Um, and, and there is an argument to say that the, the increased minerals from that diversity um, coming from different root systems, depths and things uh, will also help. So if, if the mineral status of the animals is better. There's always the lovely clean um, silage aftermaths we can make use of and I've mentioned condensed tannins uh, lots of different plant species um, contain them and they are known to reduce parasite burdens uh, 
willow contains quite a lot of them and it also recent research has shown that it contains it's what's well, full of zinc and it's full of cobalt so if you have sheep um cobalt and and worm burdens go hand in hand and there's all sorts of injections and boluses you can buy to supplement those sheep that are affected but potentially in the future with more and more trees you know being asked to be planted farmland is going to be a key area for that to, to happen there might be payments for it so willow is a good option if you are trying to get your stock to browse great and then um, i'll quickly rattle through this so we've been doing to try and get engagement both with vets and with our farming base is looking at uh, dung surveys so looking at the, both the abundance and diversity of of dung beetles and they're, they're pretty amazing little critters um, but it's not only those guys that do good i mentioned these mites bottom right that eat the fly larvae but even the yellow dung flies they're predators as well and so they they mop up a lot of the a lot of the things that we're trying to get rid of so um, this is a sort of graph showing and with photos representing each of the different things we found this is predators in a dung pat um, i'll just pick out a couple of them rove beetles and clown beetles absolute monsters that will eat up all sorts of baddies in, in the dung so they're doing really good work for us um, but again if we're using products that kill off insects then we will lose that power and then there's also a bunch of other bugs that eat muck and um, the two graphs i've just put up here one of the key points i'm trying to make is that maggots is often something i find in the dung pats but it seems to be the case on farms where there's a huge variety of other things life there they've controlled the, the fly maggots but where ivermectin has been used a lot sometimes it's only maggots that i find thousands and thousands of them so we're definitely going to get fly problems um, so i guess this is just a case of uh, agroecology and using um, using the life that's there to help control some of the problems that we're trying to treat with with these products and off the back of all of that life in the dung um, you can end up with abundant top predators and that's where we come back to biodiversity and um, again that's going to be a huge thing going forward um, certainly from elms um, in terms of getting payments uh, from subsidy and we're looking at a bit of that in, in the trough of Boland and connecting up livestock treatments with the curlew breeding success um, via the, the life that's in the dung. So if, yeah, if you're keen to learn more, we've got a WhatsApp group um, for farmers, vets, and other people who are interested to sort of do your own surveys. And uh, Bruce is part of the Dung Beetles of Farmers group. We've got a great website and we're hopefully forming uh, the Dung Beetle Trust soon, which will provide support too. So um, get in touch if you want to, and I'll not play this video because I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> and um, thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks very much, Robin. Well done for coping with those um, technical difficulties, but we, we got there in the end. Bruce, we'll um, move over to you now, go across the water to Ireland. Hello, everyone. Uh, right, so Chloe has warned me if I don't get this done in under 10 minutes, she's going to stand on a dumb beetle. So. I'll rattle through my, uh, my thing fairly quickly here. I'm going to speak quite fast. So, um, yeah, I'm a dairy farmer from Ireland and uh, milking 300 cows in a conventional system. And uh, can you see my screen here? Is this Not working? Yet, no. I did send you the oh, little oh. memo. To yeah. Oh. oh, dear. It's up in mine. <laughs> right, hang on a second. We may try again, Chloe, I think. You won't, you won't do any worse than me, Bruce. No, <laughs> yeah, it's up there. Okay, so yeah, uh, 300 cows. Um, we haven't used antimitics in the milking herd. That's, that's the old stock since uh, 2017. And it's quite a young herd the, with expansion with the milk quota abolition in 2015. And even with, without using the antimitics in, in the cows, our milk solids, kilograms of milk solids delivered has increased from 2017 in line with genetic uh, improvements. So in other words, the, the lack of antimintics hasn't caused performance issues. Um, how is this done? Well, we look at the cows first because we, we believe that the cows have to build up a resilience by getting exposure to uh, parasites, um, which we have to do very carefully. Um, so we, we, the calves themselves are they're the most at risk, but they also produce the most amount of parasite eggs. So to bear that in mind, 
Um, here is a, a picture showing the um, the has this is it stop sharing or is it still sharing? Shoot. About that. Sorry, it's it's gone on me here. One second. There is, is it, can you see this pasture contamination? So you can see here's here's the level of the uh, viable um, parasite uh, infected stage parasites at, at the different heights in the grass. So you can see down low that is where the, the biggest contamination is, and up high is very little. So with that in mind, uh, we work a, a, a long grazing grass for the calves. Now this is just the calves. I'm stressed that and. We um, we would be going in at an available cover of over two thousand, if that makes sense to people, um, or three and a half thousand in total. Um, and we don't get them to graze it out. This is the grazing height, and um, it's a picture of my dog thrown in because I like the look of it. <laughs> um, so we're, we're using to map the contamination on the farm. Then we're using this traffic light grazing, and we'll put a pin in that. I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, the basics of it, we have to think of components are pasture hoovers. So we have a bull here with a question mark. He's a quarantine bull. I will get back to him. The cows there, they actually, they should have a good um, uh, immune system that are able to cope with, with parasites. So as they, as they eat parasites, they should, they should literally just uh, obliterate them in, in their stomachs and there shouldn't be many coming out in the dome. And then of course, mechanical intervention. So Picking up silage, the silage you're putting in a pit is going to pull the, the uh, parasites off the, off the pasture and shouldn't be a problem in a silage pit. So part of it is keeping the cows moved, uh, portable equipment, cows moved every three days, back fence, and um, we have no designated calf paddock, which is important. And here's our water trough. Um, we're rolling out this way, so we move around the paddock quite a bit. With the, with the animals um, and we're using diagnostics at the same time. So we're checking the cows, dungs, doing fecal egg counts as, as Rob was talking about there earlier. Uh, this is what you will see in, in the microscope. That's what a parasite egg looks like. Um, and here's here's the different types of parasites um, that we're dealing with. So when we do need to dose based on fecal egg counts, we use the right product at the right time and the right amount Rob ref explained refusion. We worked that as well. The dump paddock I'm not going to get into because Chloe will stand on my beetle. And where do they go? That's part of the the uh, traffic light grazing. We're using them for uh, flight control. We use Stockholm tar and eucalyptus oil on the heifers. Um, this is to try and reduce the usage of synthetic pyrotides, uh, which is a you know, boron for the for the uh, for the flies. The quarantine drench I mentioned there a few minutes ago. So as animals come into the farm, um, they are brought into quarantine. They're not. So we, for example, we brought in two bulls from from someone else for breeding. They're brought into a shed, and they're given all three worm groups that they're allowed. If you have sheep, I would suggest using um, the, the quarantine uh, trenches. There, group five, five, four, five are purples and oranges. Um, so talk to your vet about those. Um, but they get these products before they leave the shed and they're turned out then to a wormy paddock. That's your refusal to make sure that they get filled up with worms again. So I'll, I won't go into this, Rob has done all this part of it. Um, but to increase the dung beetle population on a farm, I've employed two PhD students um, that work for snacks and orange juice. Um, this is our dung beetle breeding program. So we're breeding beetles on the farm to artificially increase their population. So this is how we, we trap them um, in these traps and we breed them in, in these cages. And uh, this is what we're doing for our next part of the leg of, of the operation is to catch um, geotropies and breed them in captivity. So that's where we're at with it. Um, can, have I stopped sharing screen there at the second? Yes, you have. Yes, great. I'll show you this traffic grazing now. So um, basically what, what we're doing is we're mapping the animals as they go around the farm as to what, what they're doing uh, and eating on the pasture. So you can see these fields here are green and these are my calves being let out onto the fields. And um, we, we put them onto a green paddock when they go out first. So this is a low risk paddock. 
And as we move the cans on through from one part of the farm to the other, um, we have, must remember the calves are putting out the most amount of, of parasites behind them. They most they, they lay the most amount of contamination on pasture. So behind the calves, we are painting an orange. Um, I will actually say this is the this is the, the version two, the light version. Uh, we haven't time for the pro one. <laughs> so uh, as the calves move around, then we're painting an orange behind them. And for the first half of the season, the calves are only moving to green pastures. So we're skipping this one. This one is orange. Um, and we're, we're coming behind the calves. And again, this is this is going back to orange again. Um, so the, the question is, uh, how do we change them from, from one colour to the next? Um, well, I suppose look, we have, as I'm doing the fecal egg counts, I'm determining how much uh, contamination they're leaving on pasture. So should they so they go at a very high fecal egg count on this paddock, for example, we will, or, or were on this paddock, for example, we would have put that as being red. So they give a, give a high fecal egg count there. Um, that's that's a dangerous paddock for calves. We, that, that was high levels of contamination, so we're going to do our best to avoid that one. To, to change it back then, you know, to remember our, our cow we, we talked about a few minutes ago, she's created this paddock, and as she has done, um, she's changed it. He has changed that back to green then. Um, so that, that panic will be ready for calves the next time they come around. And with mechanical, mechanical intervention then, it's going to go to the red one because that's the one that's most at risk. So we're going to put that one out in that paddock and that's going to change that back to green. Or actually, sorry, that change that back to orange because you only really want to go back one step at a time. So that paddock is now orange. <coughs> we also think about our quarantine bowl. So because he's got a few worm groups, this this guy hasn't he hasn't uh, he, can, he doesn't have any parasites in him. He's got a complete clear out. Um, <coughs> but you don't want to put him on a green paddock um, or a red one because we don't really know his history. So we're going to put him out onto the, onto the orange one to help clean it up. So this orange one has now turned to green um, and cleared it up. And that's the basics, that's the basic version of, the very basic version of uh, traffic light grazing. Um, and that's, that's basically so if, if you want uh, to send me any questions or anything, we can do so at the end. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bruce. That was brilliant. And last but last last but not least, Rich, we've um Rich is just busy doing something. <laughs> but he's with us now and he's on camera and that's brilliant. Rich is our final presentation for the evening. Just trying to turn off the other room. Oh man, I could turn off. Been hit by every tech issue I think this evening, but um we can hear there everyone really can't say that cool. one. <laughs> Okay, so can you hear me? Is that all right? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks. Cool. Dung beetle breeding. I was listening to a podcast literally like two or three days ago, and the guy was an American guy talking about how big dung beetle, dung beetle breeding was going to be the next thing. And you're already doing it. Like, you know, Bruce is ahead of the game. It's great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah. Um, that's the introductory slide. Uh, Rich Court, where we are in Herefordshire. I just thought the farm Herefordshire... Um, Icon there. We're very blessed with support from um, a few different groups that all come together under that badge. But um, there we go. Next slide, please. Or can I control it? I don't think I can. Can I? No. There you go. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so yeah, a nice picture my my, my sister took um, back in the winter. Um, I don't want to read it out because you've already already introduced me. But um, it's 300 acres and um, sheep and cattle. Cattle are a bit low at the moment because of TB, but such is life. Something we all have to live with. And just to note as well, we relatively speaking we're a dry farm um just by the nature of our local topography the rain tends to go around us so um anyway just just doesn't it just means we don't grow as much grass as some people do um and hence why good 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 uh, good slide operation there um we're looking at sort of the region agriculture because uh, and all the things that have already been mentioned and i think it's it's important i'll probably come back to this again at the end but um you can't look at one thing like it's all it's all in a in a in a in a 
it's in the round. You have to look at the whole thing. If we just look at just just worming, for instance, then there's so many other things that affect it, and that's where the soil health principles, I think, come in, and and how all those things are relevant. But um, I'm sure a lot of you know all about that. That slide is actually the, the on the left there. The soil health principles is pinched from um, Neil Scorfield's course I did earlier on. Shameless plug. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, actually, sorry, before I say that, just talking about the pasture. Go, go back. Sorry, one. That's a thistle root I dug out in the winter. And if you just, if you get, I'm sure some of you got thistles, maybe I'm the only one with thistles, I don't know. But if you go and dig a big thistle tap root out of the ground and, and actually smell it, you can smell how sweet the soil is and, and that root is because of the amount of sugar that that, and the, uh, uh, like I mean, that, that, uh, that, that, anyway, sugars that that, that that root is putting back into the soil and all the good it's doing where, it, obviously we don't want thistles in our pastures because our animals don't eat them, they tend to eat them, but, um they are actually doing some good stuff but anyway next slide please so yeah so rob's already talked about and bruce has both of you have, talk, have talked about um grazing higher covers because of where the um gastrointestinal worms tend to live and um these are just a couple of photos i mean to some people it's terrible when you're grazing to high covers and that sort of thing the photo on the left is some heifers um just to show the difference between where they're coming out and um where they're um where they, where they i just i had just moved them um the plate meter struggles when you get to high covers but that's going to be four thousand plus i think um uh, might even be more than that might be four and a half it's sort of welly height and then nailing that down in it in it in it in 24 hours and then the one on the right there's some cows and calves on some old so there's a newer pasture on the left older pasture on the right um and that's it's sort of old permanent pasture really that we're trying to regenerate with grazing so um there we go next one please okay so uh, we've got we before we kind of got into the whole herbal lays and, and improving the permanent pasture we did plant quite a few um different mixtures and i, I tried a ryegrass red clover mix which is the one you see on the left with the sheep are uh, it's not the great photo, but um, I had to get it small to send the file. But um, it's headed out ryegrass, but there's quite a lot of clover underneath, and the sheep were allowed to have the pick. And I, I've got a next slide on in a minute, which will talk about sort of how I think you can manage it with sheep. But um, if you push using lambs too hard, and probably the same is true of ca calves as well, um, if you make them eat the stalk, then they're going to suffer because that's not where the goodness is. The goodness is in the leaf. But it doesn't really matter if the leaf is like a foot off the floor or it's four inches off the floor. As long as they're eating the leaf, the leaf is basically the same. The protein level, the energy level in that leaf is basically the same. So we're not disadvantaging the animal, whether they eat the leaf down here or up there. And if they eat it up there, they've got less exposure to the gastrointestinal worms. So um, that's that's why we, we, we're doing what we're doing. And they have a chance, they browse graze, and then they move on. And then we might come back um, after a full recovery period, which would be, you know, 30 to 45 days, maybe 60 days in the autumn uh, or early spring. And um, so at some point in the year, we will reset that with either a mower. Again, Bruce has already mentioned about taking the worms away with the bales or, 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 or clamp silage or whatever, uh, or just coming in with cattle or um maybe we'll just leave it as deferred forage and we'll come back in the in the autumn with dry use or, or, or whatever so that you know there's no no problem there um and then on the right again oh go back please there we go on the right is the as a herbal lay that's from last year and um again not a great photo but um you can see the clover flowers in the foreground red clover white clover um and again, I'm not making them eat it down to the ground and just giving the sheep using lambs in this photo. And the lambs are getting close to weaning here, but just giving them chance to eat the best uh, on a mob grazing, rotational grazing system, eat the best and move on, eat the best and move on. Because we can always sort it out later. If we want to eat it down, topping is maybe not ideal, but if we want to eat it down, we can use cows or, or we can reset it with a mower. So that's one of the general questions that you'll get is that um, people say, what about the stock? Well, yeah, if you make them eat the stalk, well, they're going to suffer, aren't they? So um, next slide, please. So um, these are just, it, this is what I thought I'd put a little slide in just to sort of a, um, a summary of what kind of things we're talking about. Um, a school can be an issue if you're grazing higher covers. I fully accept that. But we manage it with a zinc foot bath. And um, I don't like using formalin. 
partly for the for my health and the lad who works for us as well um it's not good stuff it's not good for your lungs and it can't be good for the stock either so a zinc footpath is much safer and you, you i know you have to batch treat them but um it works really well and, and we had a bit of scald last year and a zinc footpath cleared it up you know within a few days and we didn't have a problem later on um and i think genetics will play a part in that but that's something we're getting in into as we move forward um so longer rest and recovery periods i don't fully understand the uh, life cycle of the gastrointestinal worms and i'm sure rob and bruce can talk about that, that later but but by using the rest period uh, as well as using you know the cows or the baler to to help to take those those worms away we can help to be, break that um that worm cycle uh the alternative grazing with cattle and sheep which, which, which we've already mentioned um but i do think it's important to, to note that that rest period in between because not only on the one hand we're looking at worms fair enough but on the other hand we're looking at, um, at trying to improve our ground and if you might not use nitrogen you might use a lot of nitrogen we don't use any at the moment anyway um so by maintaining that rest period we're allowing the ground to recover grass plants to recover and um we can build up our root reserves and then we can get to a point where we won't need it uh, going forward. Uh, Fecal egg counting, I've got a microscope, uh, same as Bruce. I'm not quite as um, diligent on perhaps uh, doing as much as I do and I, we use our local vet. It's actually not that difficult to do um, to do it yourself. There's a lot of a lot of stuff online and a lot, a lot of places you can buy the, the kit you need. Um, and there's a lot of fact sheets like the one that Bruce put up to, to tell you how to identify the, the worms. And actually, I've just got a basic microphone. The phone on your the camera on your phone is, um, well, they're quite incredible, really. I just literally, and it sounds silly, but put it up to the eyepiece, take a photo, WhatsApp it to my vet. She's like, like oh, yeah, that's a uh, strike, strike a stronger dial or it's a whatever. And, um, you know, how many did you get? And you can work out a plan uh, based on that, as Bruce said, the right thing at the right time at the right amount. Um, You've got to use your veterinary guidance. I'm not a big fan of the fact that in the UK, uh, Zolvix is available in 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 your sort of um, uh, ag, ag chemist, you know, local ag chemist. We've got to be really careful. We don't get into a place where we've got triple zent resistance. I think Rob's slide that he put out, one of the first ones, was about where people have got resistance. If you've got resistance to um, clear yellow and white. You don't want to be using a, a serious amount of um, the orange ones or the purple ones because you're going to run out. Of, you're going to run out of options. So um, I think we've got to be really careful and take veterinary advice on, on what we use and when we use it, um, because otherwise we're, we're going to run out of options. Um, just slightly different then. I think body condition score of your sheep is key. If we're going down the road of, of, of trying to manage these. Um, uh, worms without, um, I'm getting close to time now, without using the products and, and we don't want to use them, then I think we've got to accept that maybe if we've got 100 years, we might have to cut out the bottom 10, we might have to cut out the bottom 15, because if they're not going to fit your system, if they can't if they can't cope with um, with the regime that you're going to implement, maybe with, with, with the traffic like grazing or however you choose to manage it, using less wormers, then those sheep have got to go because probably their genetic predisposition is that they're not going to cope with the system but by doing that of course the remaining whatever 80% you've got left will be better and then we can breed up from there and um, I think if you've if you've got a you that's mucky and you can and you can it, it, make an excuse to for, she's got to go then I, th I, th I think that 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 is a good thing to do um, as long as you've eliminated other options like um, uh, trace elements and that sort of stuff um, quarantine drench replacements yeah that that's already mentioned really really important otherwise you can you can cause yourself all sorts of problems and um, just on the reseed side of things um, I think it's already been mentioned but um, the diverse swords grazing taller grass using those chicory the plantain all those other kind of things uh, I, I think they're better than um, than just straight ryegrass uh, next slide please if Bruce is still there I think Bruce has, has just crashed Rich um, so I'll try sharing it try sharing it instead sorry about that there's only a couple left really And one of them was thank you for listening. <laughs> oh yeah, so was that one? Was that the next one? It was, yeah. Yeah, so AgriWeb was um just because if you're managing that traffic like grazing, the type of thing that Bruce is talking about, and we're doing a similar thing, perhaps not quite as technical, but a similar thing. Um I had notes in my, I had like a whole page on my phone of like notes of this field on that date, this field on that date. 
um, and I just didn't know where to go. So we use this and you can use other, I'm sure there's other things you can use. I'm not plugging it. I'm just saying in order for us to monitor what animals are in what place at what time for how long, that's what I use. And um, I find it really useful. So um, next slide, please, Chloe. Um, so just in terms of learning, like a lot of this stuff is not that sciencey like it's is you know it can be said to be reasonably basic i suppose but there's obviously general principles and i think it all kind of works in together is in the whole farm system and it's just a few of the books i've read and um there's so much stuff podcasts and um resources on the internet and obviously rob's already mentioned the the whatsapp group and stuff like that you know uh, the, the the dung beetles and you know there's so much stuff out there i don't think anybody needs to be frightened about making a change because um, of the support we've got, I think is um, is unparalleled, really, and I think it's important we we draw on that because um, it's it's really valuable. So, uh, next slide, please. That's it. Yeah, thank you for listening. That's my bale grazing for last winter, and um, that field we did just lightly disc it, and stick a bit more seed on, and um, yeah, it's looking a picture now. But um, there you go. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rich. Hopefully um, we'll get Bruce back with us in a minute. We have got plenty of questions for all three of you. Um, I would just like to highlight to our audience that um, resources will be emailed out along with a recording of this webinar. Um, so if there was any technical difficulties at home, um, there will be a recording of the webinar on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel, along with links to Scops and Cows resources for the latest info on parasite control. And we've got a link to the Dung Beetles for Farmers website, which is full of, full of information and also links to our grazing resources too. So Rob, the first question was for you. Um, the, the figures you presented at the beginning of the presentation, were they figures anthelmintic anthel resistance for sheep rather than cattle, please? Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, there were two slides. The first was sheep only, and the second slide related to cattle. Um, yeah, so the, the cattle was very recent, um, and, and the sheep slide was from Mordon, and it was a few years ago. And I think if we look at other countries around the world, probably mirror that, we, we're slowly gonna get more resistance the more wormers are used. It's really as simple as that. Thanks, Rob. Bruce, can you hear us? Are you with us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's brilliant. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. My my laptop literally just caved on me. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> just a question for you, Bruce. The dung beetle research on cattle, is that on cattle dung only so far, or does it apply to sheep too? And are there different species that live in sheep dung compared to cattle dung? Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the, the research that's been done on, on the dung beetles um, in dung is on both cattle and sheep. So yes, they, they do provide the same services to both cattle and sheep. There are some species that would be specific to one uh, one species of, of either cattle or sheep, um, but there are some that, that um, are not picky, um, to be honest, they, they go to either one. So yes, yeah, so, some, some to answer your question, yes, yeah, some, some are specific, some are not. Um, we have we've quite a lot of species, so um, yeah, that's that's it. Rob, are we more likely to find them in in cow pats? Do they prefer one or the other? Um, are the sheep farmers out there looking for them too? They do. They love sheep poo. They're basically, dung beetles really like dry poo, so you're more likely to find them in 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 sheep poo or deer poo or or um, good beef animals on long grass, dry grass, whereas dairy cows with a lot of water components you'll find you'll often find lots of water beetles in there but dung beetles don't really like it um so much the water content so anything with nice dry fibrous poo is good thanks both and rich the grazing your sheep on taller grass have you still maintained the same performance with using lambs i'm i'm gonna say yes but define performance i think that's the key thing Output per hectare has gone up for sure. Out, um, output per animal, possibly not. Be but I, I think we, you know, we're, we're probably. I think last year we were averaging like the summer growth period, yeah, two fifty grams a day, something like that. 
um but it's a really i don't know what the word is i say dangerous might not be the right thing but you know it's kind of like it's like the yield thing isn't it with the guys the arable guys you go to the pub or you know might we did like i don't know 12 tons per hectare or 14 or whatever it is you know uh, of wheat you've either got a lamb growing if he's growing at like 500 grams a day yeah they're flying but the stress it's putting on that lamb is massive so it's either flying or it's dead probably all right you get a few to stick it but the the you know the stress so so i think it's dangerous to look at uh, performance per animal on on this kind of system so um so yeah broadly speaking i think it was okay but again there are times when i've left them on a field oh yeah there's a little bit more there i'll leave them you know maybe growth has slowed down the summer slump you get like july is time to pre-weaning um or a slow spring like we've had this year i've left i left one bunch on a, on a field a few days too long and um granted they suffered yeah absolutely because but but if yeah if, if, if it's like a whole different mindset thing but if, if you can allow them to eat what they want to eat which is basically the leaf really then i i don't, I don't, don't think that's a problem oh thank you for explaining that and are you measuring graphs are they removed when it's a particular height or are you going by eye and just in a feel for them really when they're ready to move on mostly by eye um i do measure a bit but the trouble is when you're grazing grass that's up by your welly the plate meat doesn't go much in that <laughs> so it's yeah it's a bit of a yeah yeah and, and also you'll get a false reading because you'll still have stalk there so you might still have like three thousand or something but that's not what you want them to eat you want them to eat the leaf and so so it's really kind of got to go more by eye i think otherwise it doesn't doesn't quite work yeah thanks rich and Rob, will young heifers become immune if untreated? And how long does this take, please? Yeah, I removed that slide. Um, so yes, they, they should become immune. It's all about balance. So they need to firstly see, be exposed to the worms. So the worms have to be there and you have to have not treated them with something that's going to completely knock them out. Um, uh, and I think it's important to differentiate between different species of worm we're talking about. So gut worms, I lumped together in one group, although it's lots of different types within that as well. And then lungworm, it's completely separate. Um, and they require different amounts of time to develop appropriate immunity to different types of worms. Um, Ostatagia, which is probably the most serious gut worm that we have to deal with in cattle at least, um, takes a couple of seasons. So you need the first and second grazing of, of exposure without being exposed too much um, so that we don't see disease um and longworm for example well it needs a good season and then actually it needs re-exposure as well um and, and vaccination can really help with that fluke there's not really an immunity that, that is developed so that's one of the reasons fluke is so hard to control thank you and how long a rest period would break the parasite cycle please um so each parasite has a different cycle and that cycle can change. On average, the gut worms and lung worm, it's around about three weeks, but the warmer and wetter it gets. So if it's warm and moist, it's probably around now is a good time for gut worms and, and lung worm. And the cycle can actually speed up. So you can end up getting an exponential rise in the burdens on the pasture. Um, so in terms of breaking that cycle, uh, if, you're, if you're moving every, you have to then remember that the, those worms will die off and their eggs will slowly die off so if you're moving very regularly and allowing a long rest period certainly three weeks or longer you've got a good chance of breaking that cycle so anything like that is better than a set stock system um, and then as bruce pointed out that traffic light system it's it's not only what's gone on that season it's what's happened the season before potentially as well with eggs left over on the pasture so um bruce what are your cycles generally it, it it depends um so with the do you mean the grazing cycle or the parasite cycles sorry the the yeah the calf how long how long you leave them in different paddocks oh i leave that yeah that could be four weeks with the calves yeah yeah so and i will i will state that this is just the calves we, we handle this way the cows are done the normal um we're looking at 18 day rotations 16 to 18 day rotations at present. Um, the calves would be on paddocks, I'd say 28, 30 days 
uh, old paddocks is what they are at the moment. So that kind of puts into perspective. Um, so yeah, maybe about fifty percent longer than than the, than the, the cows' rotation. Thanks, both. And Rich, what, have you got any comments on that one? Um, no, not really on that one. I don't think. There was something came to my mind just before actually, which was. Um, and I'm I'm thinking probably the people that are on this webinar are probably pretty forward thinking people and this isn't to do anybody down but the amount of times I've either been in the pub or been talking to a mate or whatever and they've looked in the in the in the in the um the dung or the muck or the poo and they've said oh yeah I saw some worms we're going to go worm them and they'll just go down to the local ag chem and they'll buy whatever they buy either met in because there's yeah, the right price and whatever yeah we used it last year and or whatever or my mate said it was good you know just Talk to your vet, do some fecal egg counts, get yourself in the know. Um, it's just the only way to go. It really is, you know. Probably jump in there, Rich. If they've seen worms in the in the dung, they've probably tapeworm. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I'm not technical enough to know. That's yeah. So yeah. And and tapeworm don't tend to cause a problem, at least for cattle that have them. So it, yeah, you you get all sorts of stuff like that. Definitely worth. Finding out what you've got first, good tip, first tip, get some samples or do what these guys do and do it yourself, save the money. I think it's interesting. I remember going to a, a talk a long time ago now and, and I, I did look in the last year, the year before at the AHDB figures, you know, you've got the top 10% of farms or whatever, you know, the, the, the AHDB data about uh, beef and sheep farms. The farms at the top have got the biggest vet spend within reason i mean obviously you know you're obviously not having loads of cesareans and stuff like that because you're probably managing and you don't get them but there's places to save money in the system and something like this that technical know-how from someone who's keen and with, with our vet we we work on a um a retainer so she get, has pays an amount of money a month and i get you know my vet plan i get some visits i get some fecal egg counts and and um it's it's proactive and I think that's far better than somebody coming in with a fire engine because you've got a problem. And um, and and we can talk about the wormers, we can talk about worm resistance, we can talk about regulations, but we can also you know talk about if you've got a problem and you need to fix it with antibiotics. This, I know it's going off topic, but there's so much pressure on us to do to get to better for, for the food we're producing and the environment that I just think being um, proactive for all these things is just absolutely crucial. I can't tell you how strong I feel about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in on that there, Richard. Yeah, um, at, at the end of the year, we go, we uh, compile all our accounts and they're all, uh, every expenditure is put in, into a subheading. <clears throat> and I've noticed there in the last few years, my professional fees have gone up. Now, when I say professional fees, that's getting your, your Rob Howe out to walk around the farm and, and tell you what you're doing wrong. And our veterinary fees, have, and, and veterinary fees are, or, sorry, veterinary expense is literally product. Um, and sick animals and that that has gone down uh, significantly so overall the two together have have lessened so you know really we're better off paying our vets to keep our animals healthy than paying our vets to cure sick animals so that's yeah. you know we need a good relationship yeah and and obviously farmers get their advice not just from vets but from sqps and trade whoever you go to to approach to get that advice make sure you ask about integrated and sustainable control and not just relying on products because you don't necessarily need them or not as many as uh, as are being used thanks all some really useful top tips there um i'm conscious of time and we have quite a few questions so i'm gonna have to try and whisk through these next ones quite quickly please if that's all right bruce thinking about your traffic light grazing system um if you this person's asking if they don't cut the silage would there be a way to turn a red paddock orange or green with a hay cut work sorry would hay cut work yeah hay would work yeah really and that's taken <clears throat> and that's taken the grass off off the paddock um and cleaning it out um i suppose when you're when you're at, at that opportunity you know cutting it as close as close as you can get away with will take as much out of the paddock as possible um that's that's gonna that's gonna bring it back yeah and i suppose you have to you also have to think about rest periods as well. The, the rest periods will bring it back as well. So you know, if it's if it's red in the autumn and it's it's sitting all winter, you know, it's not it's not going to be red in the spring when you get animals back out. You know, you can switch it back to an orange then 
and to elaborate on it a bit too, it, it's um, it's important to note the actual parasite that turned it red. Um, that that's why this is the light version. So if it's lungworm that that turned it red, lungworm's not going to be an issue in March when you let animals out to it. So you know it's it's yeah you kind of have to think of bring those things into into your mind. Or I suppose um, uh, coccidiosis could be another one. Um, or uh, nematodirus with your lambs. Um, you know, you're going to have different different risks associated specifically with different times of the year. <clears throat> Thanks, Bruce. Rob, what was the name of the discussion group you run, please? And um, this person just wanted to re recap. Oh, uh, I think that might be the WhatsApp group that we were mentioning. Um, it's, it's called. Well, it's it's a WhatsApp group. So if um, my email address was on the video that we played, so if if anyone wants to join that, just ping us a quick email. Feel free to share it. Brilliant, thank you. Bruce, could you explain what you do with your sacrificial paddock, please, after treatment? Okay, so my sacrificial paddock. Okay, I didn't get into that. Um, so that's so basically, um, when you administer an anamintic to to an, an animal for for the first um, number of days after it's been administered um the dung is, is highly toxic at that stage it, it wanes off over time but that's that's the dung that's that's really um detrimental to insects so it's it's put on literally just used for for that that operation is just for for um expelling that that dung out onto and it's put on a very long rotation so um it doesn't get any nitrogen or any any nutrients that way um and um it's just that's just literally it it's it's just to have somewhere that it might be void of insects but it's only one one part of the farm rather than spreading the issue around because there's there's a train of thought that particularly dung beetles are attracted to uh pats that have ivermectin present in them so we don't want to be dispersing them around the farm thanks Bruce. Rich, please could you explain on what you mean by um, you said that you think anthelmintic should be more highly regulated. What were your thoughts on that comment? Uh, well, it's a, okay, maybe a bit of a throwaway line, but just when if you stood in the queue at your ag chemist and some chap or lady or whatever is in there, oh, I just need to drench my lambs and they'll just have whatever. And I've spoken to my vet about this, and like Bruce said. Um, Lungworm is not going to be a problem the year, you know, in the following year, or or they'll be using a white drench maybe at the end of the year, maybe you know when really, unless you've got resistance or something else, and there's a specific specific reason for you doing that, in which case you should be informed with your fecal egg counts. Do you see what I mean? It's like it's it's triple 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 drench resistance is I think probably an issue in the UK but certainly an issue in New Zealand in some places and we know there's white resistance we know there's yellow resistance and I just see more people using more wormers that probably are inappropriate for the time and the situation it's just it's just it just cannot be a good thing and and it might be controversial to say it but I I think they all should be controlled by vets really um, um, to make sure that the right thing's being used at the right time because otherwise, it's, if they don't work, then like we're all going to be in trouble. So yeah. it's probably worth mentioning that that's happened or it's going to happen, isn't it, in Ireland? And um, is that right, Bruce? Yeah, uh, 2022, um, yeah. we're prescription only for um, for for look. Sorry there, Rob. I'm I'm stopping you talking. <laughs> um, no, no. I, I suppose look, I'm sitting on the fence with it um, a bit. We don't like further regulation and um look the guys selling the product are going to some guys selling the product are going to have control of the decision making which mightn't be a good thing but the other side in the majority of cases you're going to have a farmer going to have a conversation about parasites with his vet which is not a bad thing Thank you all. Um, Rich, do you feed any micronutrients to your sheep to help with the parasite control? Micronutrients being minerals or being being trace elements? Haven't got any more info. So we use, um, we're low in cobalt, we're low in selenium. Cobalt's a big, big, big problem at the moment or has been in the past. So we, and I think I know all these different things you can buy, these concoctions, these magic fairy powder 
concoctions you can buy will tell you that um, you know they'll last for so long. But basically, a drench, I think, seven to ten days about maximum. Rob's nodding, thank goodness. Um, and a bolus it, with lamb, certainly, I think, um, with an have it, like it's big. It's got to be big enough to go down the, small enough to go down their throat, but big enough to sit in the stomach and stay there. And so we use uh, a bolus and i reckon they probably last about half as long as they say they do maybe a bit more than that but um so we yeah we do use that and free access minerals sometimes they go nuts and they'll just nail the whole bag um pretty quickly and other other times they'll just leave it alone uh, but salt lick 24 7 they've got salt lick all the time thank you rob do you have any comments please on particular coccidio stats on soil health um, yeah, so coccidia stats are, if you read the data sheets, they can be quite toxic um, for the environment and for plant growth as well, um, and, and quite persistent. Um, so they don't necessarily, I don't, I don't think they affect dung beetles particularly. Uh, Bruce, am I right there? Do you know? I haven't come across anything, to be honest. I've looked, but I haven't come across anything. Yeah, but then it might be an unknown. Um, so I think um, certainly there's there's one there's one there's, there's two main chemicals that are used. Um, uh, one of them is particularly uh, bad for plant health, and the other one is the one that tends to get put into feed additives. Um, but again, I, I'm not sure of the detail. I don't know how much research has been done on on its effect on the environment. But neither you know neither of them are nice. So I guess we haven't really touched on coxie to, tonight in a big way um but it's a similar thing like this the same sort of principles apply um you, you want them to get immune you want them to see the young stock to see a little bit of it gain immunity um but not enough that you uh that you cause disease and it is possible to break the cycle uh in a similar way that we're talking about with with gut worms yeah thank you and is a pour on product better for cattle than a drench in terms of the dung beetles um, I, I, if that was directed at me, I think uh, if you've got the same, so pour on will likely be an ML or a clear, a clear product, um, which is one of the worst products for dung beetles. They're persistent and we know that they, like Bruce said, they attract the dung beetles, but then don't let them breed as effectively and can kill them. So if you're comparing a pour on and an, as an ML or an ivermectin, let's say, to a drench, the drench m may not be, it's more likely to be a white drench, in which case that's pretty safe for dung beetles. Um, so I think the yellow and the white drenches are fairly dung beetle safe, whereas the poor, the poor ones are mostly, yeah, ivermectins or that group and, and quite bad um, and persistent as well. So, but you do get some drenches that contain ML, so it's not always, um, about the route of administration i guess if you're if you're going to administer a a clear drench which is damaging for dung beetles there are other options there are injections which will lose less product use less product which will be better for dung beetles than than the poron there's also the argument potentially if poron is used it can be splashed around and potentially if it rains quickly after administration it might get into the environment a bit more um, Certainly, cows will lick pour on off each other, and you you see a huge variation in animals within a group um, when pour on are used. Brilliant, thank you. We've just got two questions left. Bruce, we've talked about dung beetles and arthropods this evening, but also soil nematodes are an important part of the soil food web. And is the impact of residual anthelmintics on these known? Yeah, there is there is some work done on on them. Uh, I haven't specifically looked very closely at it, at it, but there is there definitely have a negative effect on earthworms as well, particularly the macrocytic lactones. Um, and uh, yeah, just to state then as well that um, the last year there was a, a, a results of a trial conducted in Ireland on groundwater and surface water um, for. Um, Anthemintics and, and benzimidazole was detected in 18% of the sites that it, it was tested on. So it's it does hang around as well. Um, but it, it's also important to state that it was not a matter of replacing one product with another. Um, it's a, you know it's it's a, a completely integrated plan. The macrocytic lactones 
Ferguson and Bath Nord as they are, they do have their, their part to play in, in parasite management as well. And they're, they're important if they stay working, but it's knowing when and where to use them um, and just, just being responsible. Yeah, but yeah, sorry to answer, straight off a bit there. It is, um, they, they are, uh, they, they do harm other um, ter, uh, subterranean insects as well. Thanks, Chris. And the final question was for you as well. Have you seen any negative impact with rotating adult cattle grazing with calves? So this person suggested that surely doing so will heighten the risk of yoni transmission. And how do you manage that, please? Okay, well, we're testing for yonis and we're, we're, we're managing that. Um, we generally try to follow the calves with a mower, to be perfectly honest, because the calves are on an out farm. Um, that's in our situation, I guess. Calves, particularly in the first half of the grazing season, will eat very little grass. So we're only talking about a small area of ground in comparison to to uh, the cows. So basically, if you're having a 20% replacement rate on a 300 cow herd, that's only 60 calves. Um, calves will only eat a couple of kilos of dry matter a day, whereas your, your cows are up to 20. So you know they're. You know the, the the amount of grass eat and the area that they're consuming is small, and we try to yeah rotate that then with with uh, machinery more so than um, cows. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks very much. Um, apologies, everyone. We have run over time, but we've got through majority of the questions this evening. We've had some um, brilliant, challenging questions, so thank you all for listening at home. Thanks, Rob, Richard, and Bruce, for your time this evening and sharing your experiences with us. And the, um, the presentations and the questions have been recorded. They'll be available on the HTV Dairy and Beef and Lamb YouTube channels, um, along with this question session. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.